Yes, Parker, please rejoin. I'll wait for you to connect back. Is there an issue in network or something? Okay, let's wait. Let's wait for Parker to rejoin. In the meanwhile, if Rabi has also joined in, good evening, Rabia. I hope you can hear me. I'm audible and visible clearly. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, has Parker rejoined? Yes, so Parker has rejoined. So let's start. So uh, again, just uh, reiterating the same point. Do not move ahead unless and until you are satisfied by evidences in this chapter, because this is uh, one very, very misunderstood topic in whole of biology. And the, the other one after this, I feel is, um, is ecology and, and population dynamics. So we'll talk about that as well. And of course, molecular biology is very um, uh, tedious and long to understand, but yeah, we'll come there. So in the last class, anyone who would like to give a quick recap who was there in the last class? I think Iram was there in the last class and also Parker. So anyone who would like to go, Parker or Iram, whoever speaks first can go. Or I should say whoever speaks last can go. I don't know. Anyone who wants to go, Iram or Parker? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. We have the first speaker. Okay, go ahead, Iram. Yeah. So let me put let me put things in context for Alia because she missed a few classes and then you can uh, take the the wheel. So Alia, we started with uh, evolution and we started talking with uh, what is in general what do we mean by a living system because uh, we primarily will be like majorly and mostly we'll be talking about biological evolution. In the beginning, we'll we also discussed about chemical and evolution of other things as well, but Basically, this chapter is biological evolution. So we talked about how do we define something as living? And when we keep on, we keep uh, going uh, down the path to break down a living system, we reach at the level of uh, non-living materials like atoms and molecules, basically elements. So we discussed that the simplest of the life form, we discussed some theories in the beginning, what earlier thinkers and philosophers used to think about where did life come from? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life, et cetera, et cetera? Because these are the questions that were asked by various thinkers, philosophers, uh, religious leaders across the planet, because this is one thing that makes humans different from other animals. We have the cognitive capability to raise questions about the working dynamics of the universe try to understand how it works, try to understand what it needs to work, and therefore try to also understand if there is a need of a creator or if at all there is a creator, what should be the characteristics. All these philosophical questions have been asked times and again by thinkers, philosophers, like learned people of the past. So they also came up with many theories or uh, because back then scientific evidence was not something very popular. People don't know how to do science, but they knew how to do thinking. So they started thinking and they came up with all different kinds of theories. The theory of panspermia, which says that life didn't originate on the planet. It came from outer space and then it you know, kind of evolved with respect to those conditions here on earth. Now, this is a theory that cannot be uh, disproven unless and until you prove that there is no life anywhere in any corner of the universe, which is not possible humanly. So theory of panspermia still is a, is a, you know, um, a theory in contention. Uh, second is special creation, which has been busted and you know, kind of you know, um, uh, eradicated by scientific proofs because whatever theory of special creation, when I say special creation, it is the theory that's 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 an amalgam of all cultural thinking that that believes that it was created in a particular manner and these 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 are the characteristics features of the creation but we figured out we have uh, we have evidences opposing that so that theory got busted then um, a theory of spontaneous generation that life can uh, can can generate from dead and decaying matter was also a very very 
um, strong theory that lasted for very long because people used to see that if you keep a rotting flesh or a decaying matter, there will be other kind of life forms, you know, coming out from that rotting and decaying matter. So they used to think that life can arise from something which is rotting and dead and decaying. But then Louis Pasteur busted that saying that life can only come from you know, something living or, or a spore or something that has the capability to replicate. It cannot come from nowhere, like out of thin air. But then all these theories kind of only talk about how life sh was shaped and evolved and you know, where does it come from, something comes from the other thing. But the major question was, how did the first living system on the planet, if life originated on earth, how can we find proofs for it? And how did the first life, first cellular uh, systematic life form originated? So for that, people started thinking and there were Operin and Heldin who, who gave a uh, theory, they thought and they gave a theory that the first form of life uh, should have come from pre-existing non-living molecules. Now, this was a very, very uh, bizarre theory and also very bold theory at that point of time because saying that life can you know, come from entirely non-living particles is something that no one will wrap their heads around back in, back in that time. So people kept this theory in a cold box for a very long time, but then there were people who started finding if this theory makes sense, let's find evidences for this theory. And there were, uh, the first major leap was, was taken by um, Urey and Miller. So Miller's experiment, which systematically proves that the prehistoric conditions on earth, and if you, if you incubate certain non-living molecules in that for, and you give them enough time to, you know, make collide with each other and make, um, do reactions and make bonds and make compounds, given enough time in a reducing environment where there is um, no oxygen, you can find molecules which are only found in living system, which are only found in living system. So the fundamental blocks of life can be formed in these prehistoric conditions. And when they figured that out, that sugars and amino acids, which are a characteristic, um, you know, characteristic property of fundamental life cell, can come from something completely non-living. That gave the first kind of evidence. And then we talked about other evidences that show how can lipids assemble by themselves to form a membrane. And that, that again gives us proof that plasma membrane uh, is not something which needs a special, uh, special power to organize. It does organize on its own in all our soaps, detergents that we use on a daily basis. So lipids as a molecules have this tendency to self-organize. Then we talked about coacervates, the earliest type of organizations that were predecessors of a living cell. And uh, all these evidences together tells us that yes, a cell can be assembled given millions and millions of years in that kind of a environment. Now, one question is, uh, is, is this still happening at, in 2023? Uh, the answer is not everywhere. So it's not happening at the rate at which it used to happen back then because the environment no longer is, is um, reducing and um, uh, it's not volcanic eruptions are not very common. But there are evidences of still evolution of um, simple life forms happening in in pockets and areas of the planet where environments are like this, like some very, very extreme geysers and you know ponds with volcanic or geothermal energy or at the bottom of the ocean and the seas. You know? Then when we were convinced that yes, single cell life can come up and people have, people have now started doing this kind of uh, experiments in their labs. So under laboratory conditions, you can assemble and create synthetic uh, cells that, you know, that are like organizations and they can make fold, make membrane fold RNA inside it. Then the question comes how evolution, once you have that primitive single cell, how it will evolve. I think from here, Iram can take the charge and then we'll go to the evidences. Yes, Iram? Yeah. Yeah, great. 
Go ahead. Whenever you are yes. ready. Uh, so in the last class, we were talking about evolution. Okay. Uh, so in the last class, we were talking about evolution of life forms. Uh, the theory of special creation comes into this category. It has got three connotations. It states that all living organisms around us were created as such. Biodiversity was always the same and remains the same. The third thing that theory claims that Earth is approximately 4,000 to 5,000 years old. Um, all these three statements, in general, the theory was disapproved because it didn't coincide with the discoveries of the time. We discovered fossils that were uh, primitive than this age. So this theory is probably disapproved. Um, then, then Charles Darwin, he came into the picture. He was a naturalist. He had uh, this ship named HMS Beagle, through which he had explored uh, the island of Galapagos. Darwin said that existing life forms share similarity among themselves, but they also share similarity with extinct life forms. And uh, every life form is uh, under gradual evolution. One more thing that he said was about natural selection. Um, natural selection states that those who are better fit in an environment lead more, more progeny than other and therefore they will survive and they'll be preferred or selected by the nature. This is called uh, the theory of natural selection. And um, this was also, I mean, the same opinions. Uh, Alfred Wallace also had the same opinion. He worked in the island of uh, Mali Ar Archipelago. Yeah, Malaya Archipelago. Malaya yeah. Archipelago. He also had the same notions about this thing. Um, then we talked about the evidences for evolution. So uh, we have first thing that we're talking about is the fossil, ev fossil evidence. Fossils are, are the remains of dried part buried in the soil containing uh, evidences of rock form that died a long ago, long ago. Um, a study of fossil in different sedimentary layers will indicate the geological period in which they existed. So fossils show a uh, new life form have arisen from previous life form at different times in the history. All this is called as a uh, paleontological evidence. Uh, yeah, and fossils also fossils also disprove the first and the foremost characteristic point of uh, theory of natural cre creation that all the life that we see around was always the same. So if you see horses, there were always horses right from the beginning of the earth. So all these uh, all the stories that we see, all the stories that we hear about uh, creation of Earth, Sun, planets, and human race itself, in every you know cultural and religious textbooks, is that you will find similar organisms also described and discussed, like horses, cattle, but you will find no mention anywhere about dinosaurs or prehistoric Earths like marsupial. Or, the, the ancestors of marsupial or legged snakes, etc. So this tells us that people culturally were not aware of the fossils before the scientific discoveries started digging out fossils. And that also reflects on culture. So fossil evidences or paleontological evidences tell us that in the past, life was very different from what it is now. In fact, even in the present, the life we know on the land primarily or, or around in some of the life from the water bodies. If you go to deep oceans, you will find life which is entirely bizarre looking and alien-like. So if I show you a creature from deep Pacific or deep Atlantic, uh, it will, you will not be able to recognize that, oh, this is something from Earth. It will look completely alien-like, okay? So we still have not discovered the full flora and fauna of our own planet. In fact, it's very interesting that it's easier to explore space than to explore the bottom of our oceans because of two reasons. One is um, going to space is easier. You just have to, you know, go like the, you just have to overcome the barrier of escape velocity. Once you are in space, you don't have pressure on you. You have to maintain an internal pressure inside a vessel and you can just float. You just, and the second thing is energy. But when you go deep in the ocean, you have so much of pressure on the vessel that you have to build something that can survive that extreme pressure, okay? Because humans cannot survive under very extreme pressures. 
but animals that have evolved in the ocean they have evolved in a way that they can do that right and that's very amazing if you talk, take these animals out either they will instantly die or uh, they will change their shape or form into something very different so all these evidences tell us that life is very very different even in the past it's very varied and different in the present and it's going to for sure change and be different in the future yes over to you Ira. yes uh, the next step is evidence is embryological evidence this was mm -hmm. proposed by Ernest Hackel on the basis of uh, certain features observed in the embryo of all vertebrates. Yeah. Um, but what, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. What were those features? So example of this feature is vestigial slits uh, that, are, that were present behind the head um, and it's functional only in fish but we humans also have it and it is in non-functional state right so one thing that Ernst Haeckel got wrong is that um, he kind of assumed that during the embryonic development the embryo have certain features of adult form of other organisms right and this he connected to uh, evolution um, saying that the 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 current mammals actually evolved from life evolved in, 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 in the water. So mammals might have evolved from fish, but that's not entirely true because remember, evolution is not linear that it was fish and then it became amphibian and it became reptile and birds and mammals. It's not like that. It's branching descent. So things arise from some common node, just like our hand. So the common node is the wrist and five fingers arise from it. Now, not all fingers are same looking or same in shape and size. So you can say that one branch becomes fish and stays in water. One branch becomes amphibians. They try to come out of the water. And we have these kind of organisms all around us that provides us with evidences of uh, uh, links that, that we call as evolutionary links. Even in the past, we had those organisms and we have found fossils of it. In the present also, we have these organisms, which are like connecting link between one and the other kind of life. So between fish and amphibians or fish and reptiles, if you say like water dwelling and land dwelling, we have certain fish that spend most of their time on land. Do you know anyone, anyone knows about that? Fish that should be in water, but have evolved to spend its time on the ground. And then it goes back. To the water. So those are called mud skippers. If anyone knows about mud skippers, they are class two fishes. So go in search of mud skippers. You will see in mud skippers where there should be fins, you will see that it looks like a shoulder bone. So they use their fins to walk on land and look very cute when they walk on land. There are videos of it. Even in past, we had organisms like uh, Archaeopteryx. So Archaeopteryx is a connecting link between reptiles and birds. So reptiles have this feature of having scales on the body, but not feathers. And birds have feathers, but they don't have scales. And that scale-like appearance is only limit to, limited to the legs of the bird, the, the hind legs of the bird, if you see carefully. So Archaeopteryx had both the features. Another feature is reptiles have teeth jaw and teeth but birds have uh, they don't have jaw but they have beak and there is no teeth inside the beak but again archaeopteryx had both the features as we have figured it out from the fossils fossil records impressions and fossil records so <clears throat> these kind of evidences tell us about connecting links that yes life could change from one form to another you just have to give enough time and natural pressure for selection of dates. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take from here, Iram, thank you so much. And, but one of the things that I was saying that Ernst Haeckel thought is based on observation, he thought that certain features during the embryonic stage, which are common to all vertebrates uh, and which are absent in adult comes in the embryo. But he thought that these features are functional also. But uh, for example, like what Iram said that the embryos of all vertebrates, including humans, develop gill slits. Okay, and uh, but it is only functional uh, in the fish. 
and it's not found in any other adult uh, vertebrate. But this proposal was uh, disproved uh, by another naturalist and observer called Carl Ernst von Baer. So Ernst Haeckel proposed something and Carl von Baer or Carl Ernst, both of them have Ernst in their name. So for the, for the sake of not having confusion, I'll say Ernst Haeckel and Carl von Baer. So Carl von Baer, Baer kind of disapproved it that he noted <clears throat> that embryos never pass through the adult stages of other animals. So if it is the embryo of a human, it will not have any functional feature that an adult fish will have or has. Okay, But it does show some morphological similarity to the embryo of the fish, like you can see here in this picture. The first stage embryos in all the cases, right from a fish to reptiles, birds, and mammals, they are similar, right, morphologically. Anatomically, they are still developing. So after one point of time, decisions will be made. Now, this is very interesting how these decisions are made. That are two embryos that look very similar to each other develop to become entirely different as adults, as they, as they develop, as they grow. Now, these are molecular signaling, which we call as a developmental biology. And the field of developmental biology studies these signals, these cues very, very, in a very detailed manner. So we do have a capability to, to develop a tail, but we, do, but we don't, okay? Like, like, uh, like a pig or a cow. So the embryo of a pig or a cow or a rabbit also have this tail bird, and our embryo also has this tail bird. But in, in rabbit, cows, and pigs, that develops to become a real tail. But in humans, it stops developing, regresses, and do not form a tail. Instead, ends as the last vertebral bone called coccyx. So coccyx in the human vertebral column is the, is the remnant of, of a tail. Okay, And um, there are evidences that suggest that genes that lead to this developmental signaling are present but inactive or you know um, not very well functional and conserved in humans. But if you put that gene back in a human, like let's say theoretically, or someone do it in chimpanzees, they also don't have tails. Uh, we will develop tails, right? That's the hypothesis because people have done it in mouse and they have got the result. And mouse and humans are very similar in both anatomy and physiology. That's why most of the drugs that are made for humans are first tested in mouse. If they work there, um, they will most likely work in humans as well. And that happens also. That's how all our medicines work. Uh, because science is, is, is conserved. Biology and logic is conserved. So after this embryological support and paleontological support, people started thinking that, okay, one is embryological evidence, which lasts for very very small amount of time during development. The other is paleontological evidence that was in the past, but you know, not in the present. Is there something in the present, which is also long lasting, unlike just the embryo, embryonic stage, that still is a proof of evolution, right? Like someone can say that, okay, whatever happened in past happened in past, though it is an evidence, but um, how about we don't believe fossils because they are not present anymore. And how about, um, you know, I don't want to believe embryology as well. Even then, there are evidences in the present called as comparative anatomy and morphology. So the third evidence comes from... Okay, just, just give me one second, people. I'll be back, yeah? Just one second.
Yeah. Am I audible and visible, everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So I was saying that, yes, yeah, we have the third set of evidence that comes from the studies of comparative anatomy and morphology among organisms. And this started with observations that um, back in time, naturalists like Darwin and Wallace made that living systems share similarities with each other, both in the present, and they also share these similarities with organisms that, ex that, that are now extinct and were present in the past. So what are these similarities and differences among organisms? that existed years ago as well. So if we think of, um, uh, if you think about dinosaurs, let's, let's talk about dinosaurs. So uh, you all have seen Jurassic Park, I guess, right? The movie that kind of revived a generations, um, many generations fantasy and curiosity for dinosaurs. So, and some of you might also be knowing some names thanks to the movie. We don't learn it in books, but we learn there, like uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Allosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurus. So if I if I show you some, uh, I think your book also have some some pictures. Can you all come to Figure Seven Point Two? And just let me just come to Figure Seven Point Two in your textbooks. Let me just try to pull it out as well. Um, can you all see a picture of a family tree of dinosaurs? Yes, sir. Yeah, everyone can see that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, wait, wait. So while you are seeing that picture, try to understand. So what do you see at the bottom? Something common, and then there are branches coming out, right? Um, we, let me share this screen. While you're looking at that picture, try to also look, understand this. So if you look at this, the, the picture that you're seeing in your box, where there are many dinosaurs and all these uh, features that, so you see stegosaurs have these, have these um, spiny plates, very sharp plates at the back. And uh, the evidences of it, which we got from fossil records. And then we, we kind of uh, re logically recreated how this dinosaur would have looked. Of course, the colors that we assign to every, every dinosaur is all uh, imaginary and um, based on logic that what kind of diet they must be having. So, you know, uh, what colors, they, what kind of pigments they can have and what kind of pigment they can't and also taking inspiration from current reptilian world that what kind of pigments do reptiles make under what um, current conditions. But the anatomical features, so we can't talk much about the morphology and soft tissues of dinosaurs, but we can talk a lot about anatomy and skeletons of dinosaurs. So something that's common, do you think something is common between all, all dinosaurs? Is there anything that is common between everything that you see in your book. And you can also see Archaeopteryx, by the way, there, that is one branch that went on to make uh, birds later on. So all dinosaurs, the word saur means it's associated with lizard. Okay. So basically dinosaurs were big prehistoric lizards and uh, they belong, actually, they were the ancestors of the same thing that crawls on the walls of your house if you if you live in a, in a, in a tropical country. 
so and and the lizards that you found in garden garden lizards chameleons etc so they are just ancestors of those what do you think is common between lizards anything one is a tail right the body a major part of the body is also yes alias is tail dinosaurs also had major so if you compare the tail of a crocodile or your wall lizard or geckos or chameleons with the tail of a mammal like a cow or 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 cheetah what what difference do you see in these two tails any difference uh, Smaller than the dinosaurs. Yeah, so lizards, a major chunk of their body is tail, right? In lizards, whereas in mammals, that's not the case. Tails are not, you know, proportionally to their to their body size. It's they are not that big, correct? So in in organisms, uh, in mammals, tails have different functions. Like in cheetah, it helps like a like a balancing thing like when they are at very fast speeds it balances and it also helps organisms get rid of parasites and flies that are coming on their body and because mammals have softer skin as compared to reptiles reptiles have scaly skin so reptiles are not using their tail to remove flies from their body reptiles uh, their tail is a major part of the body itself uh, which is important for balancing and their it's a it's a significant part of their body weight so does it was for big big dinosaurs now imagine brachiosaurus that you see in your notebook without a tail right don't you think it will just topple in front because it is a very long neck which is not balanced you cannot imagine that without a tail right yes or no do you yes, understand yes. yeah but if i argue with you if someone argues that giraffe also has very long tail or very long necks but their tails are not proportionally that long how do how does that make sense then then the answer lies in their their um anatomy now look at brachiosaurus or stegosaurus stegosaurus also have a huge tail or tyrannosaurus which is at the top of your notebook so all these three dinosaurs with huge tails when you compare it with giraffe what is one difference that is that you will just instantly pick up in both their anatomies or maybe the neck the neck yeah like uh, the head to the body part right but the neck of a like giraffe might yeah let's say that's that's what the question is about why doesn't giraffe if it has a very long neck like brachiosaurus why doesn't it need a long tail like brachiosaurus to be stable and balanced while walking um dinosaurs have has long legs dinosaurs have long legs giraffe legs are also long uh, let me tell you you are going in the right direction it's all yeah. about legs but what is the difference uh dinosaurs have huge body like giraffe also have huge body like not as comparable to dinosaurs but yes but with respect to their bodies i'm saying i'm not comparing giraffe and dinosaur in terms of their absolute size and mass of course dinosaurs were bigger but for their size dinosaurs had a huge tail but for giraffe size giraffes don't have a huge tail as compared to their own size they should have longer tails um but what allows them to not have those maybe uh, yeah yes here yeah. so maybe they have vertical necks that makes their body stable yeah so yes you you so what iram means to say is if we look at the board for some time she's saying that if this is the head part the head of giraffe is more like this right yes yeah. the body axis but if it's the head part the head of dinosaur is more like this to the body yeah it's more correct curvy. yes but how is that possible what makes this thing possible 
Look at the legs of Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurus, and T-Rex. Their front legs are smaller than their hind legs. Do you understand that? So if your front legs are smaller, then the body weight will shift forward. Make sense? You're riding a bicycle. The front wheel of the white bicycle is smaller than the back wheel. Where, where will most of your body weight go towards, lean towards the front, correct? Including your head also. And to balance that, what you need at the back? Some weight. So you have to evolve a bulkier tail, which can keep you balanced both on front, it's your thorax and the neck, like a chest and the neck, and at the back, it's tail, and then you are somewhere balanced. You know, you have to compensate for smaller front legs as compared to the hind legs. Do you understand? Everyone? Does yes. that make sense? So for Triceratops, T-Rex, Tegosaurus, Brachiosaurus, all these dinosaurs, which are reptiles, you see that this is the trend. Their hind legs are bigger and huge and bulkier than their front legs. So, and if they are walking on four legs, they have to balance the weight with the tail. Otherwise they will keep falling, especially for T-Rex. So T-Rex, uh, though they were very, very ferocious, but you know, uh, the most common cause of a T-Rex dying is not that it gets, gets predated from other, you know, Allosaurus or higher predators. That's less likely, but the most common cause would have been T-Rex chasing something and then toppling and falling. So if you, if you want to kill a T-Rex, if T-Rex were there in 2023, humans could have killed them very easily by just tying a very huge rope between two trees when the T-Rex is chasing something. So it will just topple, fall, and break its neck or jaw. Because the weight, because its, high, its front appendages are almost, you know, it's of no use. So it will just fall and won't be able to, and it's falling at a high speed. So it will fall and will probably suffer injuries from which it won't be able to recover. So that's how T-Rex should be dying, you know, and a population should be maintained. So that's one flaw in their design. Okay. That also talks about that nothing in the universe is a perfectly designed thing. Okay. There are many flaws, including humans. Most of our systems have a lot of flaw and we'll talk about it uh, you know, like later on. But when you compare that with a giraffe, you will always find that the front legs of the giraffe are longer than the um, hind legs. Can you imagine a giraffe? Just Google a giraffe at the moment. If you can't imagine a giraffe, any one of you who have seen a giraffe will understand. But if you have not seen, just Google it. Can you see the difference in the, in the legs in a giraffe? Yes. Sir. Yeah. You see, uh, I just Google one. I don't know what it, why it, it's in 3D, but yeah, yeah. Just look at it. You will see that the bone attaching the front legs of giraffe are little highly placed than the back leg, and that allows the giraffe to balance the neck without needing a very bulky tail. That's also true for all other um, mammals that have tails. Okay, does that make sense, everyone? Yes, sir. Now, similarly, uh, we can see those features conserved in today's reptile as well, like the lizards that we have or the crocodiles that we have, which are reptiles. Similarly, evidences also come from present organisms, like in plants, this evidence of a convergent evolution. So you know what is a diverg uh, divergent and convergent evolution? Anyone has any idea? These are some terms, if you have not studied uh, in detail, but you might be knowing something about it. So I just want to know. And, uh, and of course, in your schools, this chapter is done. So of course, you must be knowing something. I just want to know what you know, and then we can build upon it. So what is a divergent evolution? And what is a convergent evolution? Let's go with the words first. Diverge. Divergent evolution. Versus converge. Convergent evolution. Yes, anyone? Diverging means, it's a, it's, I think it's an English word. What does divergent means? Yeah. 
what is diverging in physics you must have heard these terms like in your chapter optics rays and optics and things like that so if you keep a concave lens and allow light to fall on it what will happen science is all connected this is a concave lens correct parallel light rays are coming and falling on it what will be the resultant uh, what will be the uh, ray which will come out of this lens one what will happen to it uh, the lines will move up apart like away yes they will diverge from each other right yes sir the diverging rays you will make that and you know exactly with what angle all this happens in physics you have done it right if you put a con convex lens then they will converge at a point right and then you call that as the focus and if you want to find the focal of this lens then you will trace it back and find it somewhere here right so it has a virtual focus forgot all these things people see physics is equally important for you to get a rank and and you know you are also under not natural but artificial selection for which i am preparing you so it's like it's like your training it's your evolution in class that helps you you know get selected selection of the fittest that rule applies everywhere not just in nature okay so so just 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 take it like that whatever you are studying also applies to you so divergent evolution means something from a common point diverges into different directions okay that's called divergent evolution now when i say common point i talk, i either me i mean similar anatomy so to begin with the anatomy was similar and then different groups adapted differently uh, with the same anatomy and are now doing different functions because that was needed to survive in the environment okay so if i talk about the four limbs of mammals okay so let's come here look at this example so a man 1 2 and 4 so what you see in one is a man mammal cheetah another mammal whale aquatic mammal and bats another mammals but they are flying mammals so one that man who can mostly do everything but not with very uh, so we are you know we call it so humans are jack of many trades but master of none except for one trait that is cognitive capability and the ability to think and create and also destroy uh, whereas cheetahs have adapted and evolved to be the best predators one of the best predators in in grasslands so they are very very fast you know one of the fastest organism on land probably the fastest yes whales again being mammal have evolved and adapted to be the best in the ocean one of the best in the ocean bats have evolved and adapted to be one of the best in flying and survive uh, accordingly but if you take the four limbs of all these organisms because all of them come from the same lineage okay so their four limbs will show remarkable um, similarity so in humans we all know that we have the hand contains some set of bones what is this one called the top okay, the biceps and triceps muscles are it's called humerus right you're going to be doctors you have to you will be dealing with skeletons a lot if you are planning to be doctor so humerus just like in the leg we have a femurus femur bone and a humer bone and then in the in the four limb four arm sorry in the four arm we have two bones which are ulna and radius right ulna and radius in the legs we call it tibia and fibula so just remember these some terminologies and then where our wrist begins and the ulna and radius ends and the wrist begins we have small small bones clustered together which are called 
कार्पल सॉरी बेस ऑफ द रेस्ट basically this thing this part from which the fingers uh, the digits then come out they are called carpal c a r p a l they are not c a r p e l that carpal is uh, in uh, in the female female reproductive part of the flower but these are carpal p a l and then they are called metacarpals <laughs> excuse me Sorry, I have I have a habit of not sneezing just in single. Sorry, the chain, always. Yes. So you see these series of bones in this order, in this fashion in humans. You see the same series or fashion followed in a cheetah's forelimb. So you have this humerus, which is a single bone connected with two bones. After that, then something like. not like they are called only something like carpals and then metacarpals but that's still you can say that both cheetah and man are on land they both are mammals so they have uh, anatomical similarities that's fine and you can probably say that okay back in time both of us might have a common ancestor but interesting thing is when we look at the whale now the four limbs of whale are no longer used like it is used in cheetah and humans so to to a great extent you can say that okay cheetah use it to run grip you know when it is predating it uses the four uh, the claws of the four limb to grip the 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 prey similarly humans you know especially when they are fighting or they are snatching something they use the four limbs for gripping but what do whales use the four limbs for swimming right they use it like a flipper so the whales of the flippers of the whale when you do a ct uh, when you do a x ray of it you will see the similar phenotype one single bone now of course it is very reduced and thick so it has reduced in length and grown in width because you need a flat flipper you don't want a long flipper like a stick like our hands are because they are not that's why we are not very very great swimmer because our hands cannot generate that much of backward push of water that flippers of whale can generate but you see the same pattern a single bone like humerus then followed by two alnine radius then carpals and metacarpals correct now the metacarpals here are extended right because the flipper has to be wider at the end is my internet connection unstable is my voice cracking anyone it's showing to me that it's unstable no sir no okay perfect if my voice cracks please let me know now why do whales have extended metacarpals because they need towards the end the flipper has to be as spread as possible so that they can you know push the water back to swim now in bats bats use their four limbs to fly right in air and that's a real flight like they fly fly they're not just gliding so for that but again you will see single bone like humerus two bones then very reduced uh, carpals and again extended metacarpals so this is similarity in anatomy but when you talk about function what is the sorry what is the function of the first man hold lift grip right anything for cheetah it's like walk and run and also grip the predator for whales it's swimming and for bats it's flying so when the, this thing happens in evolution that closely related organisms having similar anatomical structures um evolve with the same structure 
to to get to to adapt differently and have different functions then it's called a divergent evolution is that clear everyone does that make sense people any any doubt anything am i audible yes sir yes anyone has a question no, sir. Okay, and these so, organs, yes, you know. So wings right. are supposed to be light, right? Wings are supposed to be light. Yes, right. So um, having a skeletal system in wings, like in like a bat does, won't it be very heavy for the bat? Yes, right. You're you're completely correct, and that brings us to. I was going to discuss it. Uh, a little down the line but yes since you have raised this question apart from just the just tweaking with the length and thickness so one thing you can see is the the bones of the bat in the wings are extremely thin you know so when you if you see a very small bats like fruit bats or bamboo bats they are very very small bats in those these metacarpals won't be having the same thickness of the bone like we have in our fingers or like whales whales have very very thick bones but bats are very thin you know toothpick like sometimes very very thin bones so that is first thing they do to reduce the weight like you said their bones are thinner also their bones are lighter in weight so from the inside if you any one of you have seen a bone structure the bone uh, from the inside is like hollow it's not bigger bones are hollow from inside even in humans it is hollow our bones are filled with bone marrow which produces um, b cells um, but in, in in birds it's hollow it's called pneumatic bones which have air cavities in the bone now that makes the bone even lighter okay similarly bats being mammals they are not birds but they have adapted the similar strategy uh, of having pneumatic or, or lighter and hollow bones does that make sense you know that helps them fly so their bones overall in the body are not very thick and heavy they are in general light okay perfect so good question so that's divergent evolution and all these organs like the four limbs four limbs of mammals are known as homologous organs homologous organs now the word homo means same similar and logos basically it comes from origin or logic so they have the same origin or similar structure and similar logic so they are homologous organs and homologous organs are evidences of divergent evolution is that does that make sense how comparative anatomy is a evidence of evolution sir so i have a question Yes, you know. So this might be a little deviating from the topic we're discussing, but yeah. I'm curious to yeah. know that uh, why don't we talk about dragons in evolution? Yeah, right. Why don't we talk about dragons in evolution? It's it's actually the similar question. Um, so you know, someone asked this question to me a few years ago, one of the batch. So thanks for bringing this question again. I had another curious student. So you're the second one. You're the second student who was asking me this question. that reminds me of a good discussion that we had uh and i remember i said well, uh, the, the, uh, it's like something similar why we don't talk about dragons in science is a similar kind of question why doesn't any religious textbook talk about dinosaurs because people in the past who came up with the social structure culture and establishment of religion in a proper manner were not knowing they had no evidence of prehistoric life or dinosaurs so that's why you will never find anything about dinosaurs anywhere in any religious textbooks similarly you will not find anything about dragons in any science textbook because we have no evidence of dragons um uh, they are mythical creatures people in many cultures have folklores about fire spitting flying huge monsters 
um sometimes uh, people scientists also did not discard it this theory they also thought okay what they are saying look something like a dinosaur but with the ability to spit fire right and also so, to fly and also to fly yes of course so they they should have so flying is not a problem we know that pterosaurus if you go back to the same diagram uh, in your textbook 7.2 look at so there are two branches of flying things one is archaeopteryx that is a connecting link and th that evolved into birds that is the ancestor of birds basically but you see also another branch called pteranodon the pterosaurus do you see pteranodons those were flying yes. dinosaurs they, those did not have feathers but those have skin folds like bats so we know that even without feathers you can fly pteranodons were flying back then we have their fossils but pteranodons are very small they were not at all nothing looking like a dinosaur uh, nothing looking like a dragon so if you see the features mythical characteristic features of um, dragons people of if if a dragon is sitting you will think it's a dinosaur with you know flying capabilities so scientists thought okay maybe you know some dinosaurs could fly that's not a problem the problem is spitting fire you know the problem is an organism spitting fire and you know being that huge and flying with that huge body weight so pteranodons and archaeopteryx archaeopteryx had tails but they were feathers so light tails birds fly with light tails anything that fly doesn't have very very heavy tail bats don't have heavy tails don't have tails at all pteranodons were dinosaurs which were flying all dinosaurs were having huge tails pteranodons did not have tails makes sense when you gain some ability you have to lose some ability it's a trade off between what is what is allowed by the rules of physics and natural rules and what you want to become so dragons don't make sense for two reasons one the body structure that people you know describe in in myths and stories it can't fly you need huge wings let's say you give it it can't spit fire so that's why and we have not found any fossil evidence of any dragon ever anywhere uh, so th these are the reasons we don't talk about dragons so it's like right? a non fictional character it's like unicorn Fiction. yeah it's it's, yes. it's not fictional character fictional yeah. it's character, not sorry. it's not non fictional so unicorns we also have not found anything about unicorns we have rhinoceros with one single horn <laughs> but nothing like a horse that had a horn but more like a uh, you know a baby elephant or rhinoceros with a horn we have had horned um, dragon uh, dinosaurs also like uh, your triceratops so triceratops had two horns here and one at the nose and that's why it's called triceratops so there's this three horned dinosaur but we have not found any unicorns we have also not found any dragons so those are mythical creatures yeah yes perfect good question though yeah thanks for bringing it in so now we understand what are homologous organs and how they are evidences of divergent evolution similarly we have something called um, convergent evolution the 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 other form now homology or homologous organs indicate common ancestry write down these lines homologous organs are evidences of divergent evolution homologous organs are evidences of divergent evolution and it indicates common ancestry among organisms it indicates common ancestry and this again goes against the characteristic features of theory of special creation because that says uh, that the creator have created everything differently you know using a different mold so why a cat is a cat is because it's very different from a horse a horse is very different from a human a human is very different from a lion a lion is very different from a from a from a another it's a bat but according to science they are not so different their anatomies are same in fact their physiology is same the kind of hormones that are produced in their body are same the kind of diseases that they get are again very same in nature so we get all the diseases that humans get um mouse also have 
those diseases and that's how that's why we can test all the drugs in the disease models in mouse so we have mouse who are diabetic mouse we have created diabetic mouse and then we try some drugs and if it, it if it helps that mouse by with reducing the blood sugar level we know that using the same biochemistry rules it will use it will help humans as well yeah yeah cool so this is homologous organs some there are many examples of homologous organs not this one for example a uh, hearts and brains in vertebrates so if you took look at hearts in vertebrates heart are also again homologous organs will with changes as we go in different different categories of vertebrates so uh, going from fish to mammals uh, from two chambered we get three chambered and then four chambered heart but then you will see the uh, it's because where they are and what kind of evolution um, adaptation was required and then again for brain if you look at the brain structure of a human and you compare it with the brain structure of uh, let's say a lion or a, or a monkey or a chimpanzee you will see conserved regions the only difference will be the size and the number of neurons which are present in that region so humans have a very high processing brain uh and and that's why our cerebral cortex is the biggest part so we have the huge frontal cortex in our brain so the whole top part of our brain is the cortex and that's where all the high order processing happens that's why we can do maths better than other organisms earlier we used to think that other organisms cannot do maths that's wrong it has been shown experimentally and i used to do this one series called recent trends in in biology for, for students who want to pursue a career apart from being doctors in biology who wants to go for research and other things so i used to i used to teach there that you know that chimps can do much faster pattern recognition and numbers than humans can do and this has been experimentally proved they are at a early age if you compare a, a chimp which is like a 13 teenager human chimp will outright defeat any human the smartest human in doing pattern recognition and mathematics so their brains can do maths but the thing is they don't need it when they keep getting bigger and bigger they need more muscles they need more strength they need to be more violent to be the alpha male they are not going to become scientists and make bridges and send probes in space and land rovers on moon that's why um you know they they don't develop that that part of the brain that much but instincts and and uh, healing abilities and fighting instincts and muscle control and reflexes are all very well developed in those organisms as well okay so hearts brains all these are um, homologous organs in plants also we find that because it's not like only animals are evolving plants are also evolving so when i say homologous organ in plants i mean that from the same tissue plant tissue now plant tissues are very different from human tissues or, or animal tissues two different structures come out so one is thorn in in bougainvillea you know about bougainvillea plant that have these paper like flowers like their petals are paper like they come in i think two three variations pink red and and white maybe and then the cucurbita family of plants that have tendrils so bougainvillea the way it has evolved it needs thorn for protecting itself from herbivorous animals that feed on the plant so they decided when i say decided they did not decide like humans do but in evolution a structure which is more th more thorny and pricky got selected because that ensured their survival better but for cucurbita family that grows in entirely different space it did not need those thorns but instead their stems are not very very strong so bougainvillea has stronger stems stiff stem so for protection they can they can get thorns cucurbita has very soft stem so their stems cannot stand on its own so they need tendrils and not thorns so tendrils help in gripping a surface and then the plant can crawl so you know creepers that we call crawlers and creepers or climbers have tendril but tendril and thorns both of these plant structures develop from the same plant tissue so anatomically they are same tissues again diverted you know for two different functions one gripping 
when climbing and the other for protection. Does that make sense? Again, they are homologous organs in plants. Make sense, everyone? Yes, yes. no? Yeah. Sir. Yes, go ahead. Yes, someone said yes. Someone said sir. Anyone has a question? No? No, sir. I said yes. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't hear yes. I just heard sir. So I thought. Okay, anyways. So let's go forward. And the second kind of evidence is based on analogy. So this is homology, which talks about common ancestors. In evolution, so and not, uh, homology evolved because the same kind of organisms went to different environments and started living. So cheetahs being mammals went to grasslands. Humans being mammals went to live very different life. Bats being mammals went to become arboreal and flying. Whales being mammals, you know, went back to water. So you know, we have evidences and you will be very surprised to know. Do you know which is the closest ancestor of uh, a whale? What is the closest ancestor to whales in mammals? Just take a guess. Do you think it's fish? Yes, no, people. What is the closest? I got some answer in chat. Let's see. Someone says reptiles. Mm, closer than that. Let's not go to. Let's not change uh, the the category at all. Let's stick to mammals. What is the closest relative to whales? We are not close to reptiles. Reptiles are cold-blooded. Mammals are warm-blooded. So we are very different from reptiles. So whales look like big fish, isn't it? Huge fish. It has all the features of a fish. Streamlined body. Sharks, says Parker. Sharks are also not closest to whales because sharks are fish. Sharks are very, very different anatomically and in evolution from whales. Though they might look similar to you because they both have streamlined body, they both have flip fins. So sharks have real fins. If you do a X-ray of their fins, you will not find the, the organization of bones like whales have. Plus sharks can be both bone, bone and cartilaginous, but they have entirely different structure. In their, in their fins. So we call shark fins, but we call whale flippers. So sharks are not at all closely related to whales. And that's where the power of science comes. Just by looking, you, you won't be able to tell what whales evolved from. So the closest ancestor to whales are hippopotamus, hippos. Now hippos are, hippos look more closer to cows, buffaloes. But if I say that hippos are the closest to whales, you will be a little surprised, right? But that's true. Hippos and whales are very, very close. Okay, they are the closest ancestors to each other. And they are the examples of mammals who evolved on land and then went back to water to adapt to it. So after amphibians, everything evolved on land. Like even amphibians, they, they, they need half... Uh, they spend more than half of their time on, on land and then they also need water for reproduction. Reptiles are completely land dwelling. So are mammals. But then the, these reptiles and mammals, we have water snakes. Snakes are reptiles. Water snakes have adapted to live in water, but they first evolved on land and then they went back to water. Same happened with whale. So even if you do genome sequencing, you, you compare their compare these two organisms genetically, physiologically, anatomically, you will realize that 
hippos are the closest to whales and not reptiles or sharks okay make sense everyone and we also know from both uh, phylogenetic studies and evidences fossil evidences that both of these two different organisms hippos and and whales it's not like whale evolved from hippos both hippos and whales evolved from a common ancestor that used to live 55 million years ago and we have found the fossil records and some evidences phylogenetic evidences yeah great so uh, going forward along with um, um, divergent evolution the another kind of evolution that happens is convergent evolution now as the word says converge when do you think organisms need to converge when the when exactly what happened in divergent evolution exactly opposite of that happens so similar set of organisms goes to different habitats they have to show divergent evolution to survive if a mammal goes to water it has to become whale like if a mammal goes and starts flying it has to become bat like if a mammal goes and starts becoming a four legged predator it has to become cheetah like but on the other hand think of organisms that were very different but they came to similar habitats and now they have to adapt similar to each other but they don't have similar anatomies so that's called convergent evolution so think about uh, the flying organs of birds which can fly bats which can fly butterflies which can fly so all these three birds bats and butterflies they have organs which help them in flying correct but one is a mammal the other is a bird aves and the other is a insect and they have entirely different anatomies right completely different anatomies so wings of a butterfly wings of a bird and wings of a bat all these three are called analogous organs okay so the examples uh wings of birds bats and butterflies interestingly all starts with b wow okay never noticed now what is the difference the wings of birds are made up of what are the wings of birds made up of Come on, people. Feathers. Yes, they are made up of very light materials called feathers, right? Which keeps them very light and helps them in flying. What is the wing of bats made up of? They are not actually wings, but we call it, let's call it wings for now. It is actually a skin fold. It's skin only, right? And for butterflies. what are they made up of chitinous scales right chitin the whole exoskeleton of insect is made up of chitin right so very different anatomies but serve the same function so write down write down uh analogous organs organ structures evolved evolved to perform similar functions anatomically different structures evolved to perform similar functions and therefore uh, you can write the examples wings of birds bats and butterflies anything else you can think of 
in animals first. Let me tell you one very interesting thing about another anal analogous structure, which is eyes. So eyes in a human versus eyes in a in a in a insect, you know, like a house fly, uh, as compared to eyes in an octopus. All these three different eyes in a mollusk, in an insect, and a mammal. Two are invertebrates. One is vertebrate. All have structures that helps them to see, but they are very very different structures. If you look at the anatomy and the tissue um, with which they are made, they are entirely different in their function. Okay, but they serve the same function, which is to be able to sense light. Now, eyes are very very interesting organs to study because we often think that our eyes are the best designs, and uh, I have I have also I, I have read that humans are taken as an example to to vouch for the theory of creationism that something as perfect as the human body can only come up if if there is a very very intelligent creator setting every piece in place and which is perfect but that's not true our eyes are very flawed a design when it comes to they are not energy efficient first second if you if you go to the structure of eye. So light falls in our eye from the front, but the way it has evolved is a reverse thing. So light comes and the photons have to go at the back and even at the back, the back of the back. So we have a retina, right? You all have said about retina. You know, yes. retina people. And in retina, we have a optic cord, right? We call that optic nerve, right? And then we know that retina is lined by photoreceptor cells here, right? The whole retina is lined by photoreceptor cells. And this is the lens. Light comes from here, falls on the retina. So you might be thinking that the photoreceptor part must be exposed from where, from the direction where the light is coming from. That's a very obvious thing to think, right? It's an obvious design. If I would have been designing an eye or when we design anything which is reflective or you know light sensitive we put like solar panels we put whatever senses light exactly in front that's not same in eyes uh, in human eye if i draw a big section like this is the section let's say i draw i'm drawing then the receptors are something like that so what's embedded inside here is these receptors okay so photons have to enter inside they cannot just you know contact from here and get sensed they have to come from the back side to be sensed so, so that's a little a different design and because of this the flaw in the eye is it's like a lot of cables are being laid throughout and then all these cables need to be clumped together like imagine like you are making a you are making a a, a led spectrum on your wall so what is the best design is drill a hole, make the LED peeping out from the wall and the wiring should be at the back. So that at the back, you can collect all the wires without affecting the front side. Correct? That's a good design. Makes sense to you? Yes, sir. If an engineer comes and takes some wire to this side, some wire to that side, and it's all haphazard, but yes, still LEDs will glow. Or if they are photoreceptor, plates they will still sense light but that's a very haphazard design right so that's what is there in the eye and because of that you have to take all these wires which are coming on the on on our side of the wall which it should it should be on the opposite side through a hole but then we have to collect all these wires and make a big hole through which all of them can go and that is where our optic nerve is that's why in our eye there is a blind spot so there is a spot in our eye where even if light falls, it cannot sense anything because that's a hole through which the whole optic cable goes to the brain. Okay, so it's like an inverted design, a flaw in design. Does it make sense, people? And our eyes are very different from octopus and insects and the way they both work. So another example is eyes of octopus, humans and insects, which are analogous organs. In plants, can you think of anything in plants? Which uh, which could be analogous organs, different structures but similar function. 
Uh, how many of you eat sweet potato? potato. Uh, yes, great. See, sweet potato and potato. The reason we call one as sweet potato because it's sweet. But when these names were given, uh, we didn't know that both are not same. Sweet potato is a is a proper root. It is a true root structure of the plant. But potato is a stem structure of the plant. So the tissues are very different. But the function that they have adapted for is storage of food. So we know that potato also stores starch, whereas sweet potato also stores starch. But one is a root modification, which is sweet potato. And another is a stem modification or a shoot modification, which is potato. So this in plants is an example of analogous organs uh, performing the similar function. Okay, does that make sense, everyone? Yes. Okay. Now, even, so there are three evidences that I gave. Uh, how many of you are convinced with these three evidences that given that there is one simplest kind of life form, it can evolve into a variety of different life forms. Those who are convinced, raise their hands. Those who are not, should not raise their hands. And if I don't see raised hands, then I'll give more evidences. But anyone who's convinced with these three evidences that, yeah, it makes sense to me. Like, I'm, even if you are like 90% convinced, raise a hand. But yeah, it makes sense. Life can evolve in one direction or the other. And these are the evidences. Anyone who's convinced? So I see, I see someone convinced, but most of you are not. Oh, that's great. So being critical is very, very good and appreciative in science. So if you are not convinced that all these different life forms can come from one single origin, how about I tell you that we humans are doing it all on our own from some centuries now, some decades now, I should say. Even centuries is good. But we were doing it unknowingly in the beginning, but now we know the reason, the genetics behind it. And um, yes, so let me ask you one thing. How many different kinds of dogs do you see around yourself? Those who are not convinced, come on. So I, I saw Iram raised hand, but let's hear it from uh, Rabia or Parker. How many different kinds of dogs are around? Like what you have seen, not all, but yeah. Many, Parker says many. Uh, can you name a couple of them which you think are entirely different from each other? So let me start with one of my favorites, let's say a German Shepherd. It's not my favorite because it, it, I have one. Uh, it's favorite because it's very ferocious. So a German Shepherd and something which is entirely different from a German Shepherd, a pug, yeah, or a golden retriever. A golden retriever, you can still say, yeah, it, like, it looks something like it, but just a different color and different fur. But something about Chihuahua, a Chihuahua breed or a pug. So if I say that a German Shepherd and a Chihuahua basically are the same species, will you believe me? They both have the same genetic material, the same genes inside their body. Will you believe me that a Chihuahua is same as a German Shepherd, right? But do they look same in any aspect, behavior or their size or their color, anything? Do they look same? No. How, so that's one example, which is called artificial breeding that humans have done with some organisms, which includes rabbits, domesticated organisms like cattle, cats, and dogs. It all started with dogs in the beginning because we, we started domesticating dogs as early as the evidences go as early as I think um, 10 to 15,000 um, BC, like around 17 to 20,000 years from now. We have been living in close associations with dogs. Um, so that's called domestication of organisms. Same goes for horses, but even a stallion and a domesticated horse doesn't look very, very, very different from each other because we are domesticating horse for something which is conserved, like they should be big, powerful, and they should be able to carry weight. So not much of change. But for dogs, we started breeding them for a lot of different reasons. Looks, size, how docile they are, how cute they are. Nowadays, we don't 
not everyone keeps a pet dog for safety and protection sometimes because if you are keeping a dog for safety and protection you would not like to keep a pug or a chihuahua or something which is you know which can be very easily overpowered you would like to do keep something like a german shepherd or something more you know big and aggressive but same goes for cats we have pocket sized cats these days you know these cats won't survive even an hour in the wild because they are all very very genetically modified and um and uh, what do you say uh, domesticated but they all come from the same species they are different breeds based on some tweakings that we have done in them but they can still interbreed this is the proof that they are from the same species a species can interbreed together so if you breed two different looking dogs one of the progeny might be very different then you select that and you keep doing that so it's like select and breed select and breed so it's called artificial selection humans have been doing artificial selections with both plants and animals and have created something very different from what is present in the natural world so if humans can do this we can create a chihuahua so it's like humans created chihuahua they are not found in the wild right as dogs dog species they are not different species in, uh, in fact similarly we created these small pocket sized cats we have also created rats that glow in the dark or or different other things so these are all created as because we could harness the power of genetics and we can make certain changes select one kind of trait nourish it provide it protection allow it to reproduce in nature they won't be selected so pugs are very bad with their eyesight strength and their ability to hunt down anything so if you don't give your pugs food in a dog bowl they won't they won't be able to go and hunt for food so if anything like a pug would have evolved in the wild it would not have been selected and survived right because it would have competed with other organisms would not have gotten food would not have found a mate and would have died so this continuously keeps happening any di- divergence from a species a different kind of mutation it only gets selected if it is useful if it is not gone for humans also we have all different um uh, because humans work on ethics and morals which are not scientifically justified at all or you cannot you know describe or define it scientifically so humans even with weaker eyesight human can correct it with spectacles humans with a uh, um, weaker bodies or disabled bodies can also get aids and prosthetic limbs and still survive but imagine a time when humans were in the wild do you think that all these abnormalities will help us get selected in nature because nature nature is merciless mercy ethics morals are all you know it came to us through culture and our own rules right but in nature you will not find a deer or you will not find a tiger with a bad eyesight a tiger with a limping leg surviving and making more and more progeny so that does not happen so artificial selection is an proof that natural selection given millions of years will be more powerful to create very varied organisms because we could do it in just few decades uh, less than a century right so after this like we have done it for plants also so how many of you are now convinced that evolution is a is a process it can allow organisms to evolve from one form to multiple other forms so i see mariam was already there parker coming on my side rabi is also over there that's great ali is also convinced just oh i should have talked about dogs in the beginning then <laughs> but anyways that's great that's great but uh, i'll be more than happy if you have still some you know some uh, what do you say uh crit- some some critical um questions in your head because in the next class i will be giving you more examples from studies that have been done to support and to study the mechanism of evolution so what are we going to talk about in the next class is something called industrial melanization that is like natural selection in process okay right when it is happening in front of our eyes so that is a proof for natural selections happening and then we'll go to study what 